So I want to share with you the techniques that I've developed that I get such a kick out of. I never, ever have any doubts about what to paint or how to start a painting because I just jump in there with mark makings and then layer on top of that and then maybe collage and then, well, you will see. So um, the difference between a master and a beginner is that the master has failed more times than the beginner has tried. And so that's really what it takes is just painting. And so I feel my main job as an instructor is to help people get excited about creating and to never stop because it's kind of easy to get disillusioned and give it up. So I, I believe in just keep pursuing and adding to your repertoire. So I guess we'll see if my rinky dink uh, setup here will translate. So I've got this naked raw board down here, which I love to paint on. And I think I'll just show you for a minute why I like that. And then I'm gonna use this paper because it is a larger substrate, which will um, give me just a better surface. I like to work large, which is like that painting behind me. That's a three foot by four foot painting. And so to work on a small substrate sometimes is rather confining. But with a raw board, there's no um, a sealant on here. It's very absorbent. And so I can give you an indication of how I feel in my stomach right now. Not really nervous, I'm hungry. <laughs> it's starting to get cold here and dark. So um, out here, my extremities have that kind of shaky quality too. So I'm just drawing with a ballpoint pen on a raw board, just putting my energy, I'm marking my territory. I am putting a little bit of this moment, this time on the surface. With a water-soluble pencil, I can also make marks. And I might even write something about it like burr. Maybe this um, painting now will get me warmed up. I always turn my painting 90 degrees at each step. And in this way, I compose the whole area. You know how easy it is to just work on one little part and have that part not overall become a, a good relationship of sizes and shapes and lines. With oil pastel, which is a resist to water media, I can make some subtle little marks in here. And then when I go over it with paint, they will be revealed. So I'm setting up some little surprises for myself. So now we have line, we've got some energy, we've got something going on here that I can paint over. So I wanna show you what it's like when you paint on raw board with, uh, these are fluid acrylics, which means they are a little less viscous. They will flow more on the surface. And so with a big brush, we'll just slurp them on there. This is my bad boy brush. Nice and cheap. And um, let's add another color in here. And because it's so straggly and I've abused it, it gives you those kind of rough dry, dry uh, brush marks on the side, like here. We'll turn this 90. And because acrylic uh, is dissolved by a alcohol, alcohol's a solvent, you can flick that on there and get some movement, it pushes the pigment out. So I've got line, I've got wash. Kind Joan, of this is Stephanie, we have our first question. 
Okay. Do you like to cut your own boards since you work very large or how do you address that? Well, uh, I, I go up to 24 by 24 on a raw board, but when I paint large, like the one behind me, those are stretched canvases. And I, I have painted on larger boards and I buy those and have them cut and I use the MDF board for that, the one eighth inch. So I have, but most of the time I just work on stretched canvas, which it does take the paint differently than does the board because it's sealed. And so it's gonna bubble up more, but it works. You know, it's still very uh, fun surface to do all these techniques on. Sometimes I lay it on the floor and walk around it so I can look at it in all those different directions, or I will put it on an easel and just turn it on my big easel. So working in a yin yang fashion that is um, maybe dark and then light or many shapes and then few, or it's line like here and wash. And then maybe because this is a transparent area, I would want to go opaque. So then I would ask myself, well, if I was going to put some opaque paint on there, how would I do it? So many wonderful ways to get the paint on there. And this is my gesso, which I buy by the gallon, and then I put it in that Talente gelato thing. It gives me a reason to eat gelato, right? So just buttering this on with a plastic card here, nice and thick and very opaque. And I get real curious because it's like, well, what will it be like if I drive that through the wet stuff? And I realize, oh, that's sort of interesting to me. And then seeing this makes me want to draw into it. So I might make little, that's kind of got a glare on it. I might move that away and see how that works. There we go. There's little marks on here. And then one of the best things about working with acrylic paint is that it seals itself so that you can put many, many layers on top of each other. <laughs> Look what I got, a chicken. See the eyes and the beak? I don't want a painting that looks at me. So I'm taking the eyes out and we'll just make a whole bunch of them. And then they won't have two eyes there. But to soften some edges with paper towel, we'll blend some of the paint together. So I can put it down thick and get some uh, opacity. And then I can wipe through it and get translucency. So we'll turn it this way. I'm having fun on this board. Um, and then I like to do a thing where I spray the paint. So I buy these little Holbein watercolor spray bottles and put a little high flow paint, which is what Golden created to take the place of airbrush paint. And so this is um, highly pigmented. So I just put a little water in there and then a squirt of that and I can spray it and get a mist. You still should clean the nozzle out after working, but I always forget or don't, don't want to, I'm lazy. But it will tint and give this soft effect. And what I like is seeing how it goes into that thick, thick paint in there. It's just really juicy and gooey so fun. Okay, so I've got some thick opaque paint. I've got some wonderful blooms in here, subtle little things going on. You can also see how it gets absorbed by the board and reveals the texture of the wood grain in there, which is pretty darn fun. So now let's see. We've got line, we've got a few shapes just made by value change. I could actually draw a shape on there as an outline with an oil pastel. 
So this just is a shape that's got a perimeter, goes outside. So I've done shapes in a couple different ways. Um, starting to build up some texture here. We're getting um, the illusion of texture and then some actual texture in here. Sometimes it's fun to just take paint right out of the bottle and draw with it. Putting these little dashes down and then I like to squish them out with newspaper. I started using a lot of newspaper because they were delivering it to my house every week. And I never read it, but I didn't want to throw it away. I could recycle it. But then I thought there ought to be something I could do with it. So I started to um, do this technique of squishing paint with it. I'm gonna put a couple of pieces down. I'm gonna put some through this thick stuff and see what happens. Maybe I'll put another little piece over here. And what I like to do is use it as kind of a stencil. So now you can see I've got these different strips of it and I've got gaps between them. I'm going to press this down into the paint. Sometimes the newspaper sticks in the paint and I get a little collage in there. And sometimes it just squishes the paint. But now I could do something else. Let's see. I could take, um, oh, I decided to use this today, fine line applicator. So I put a little paint in here. tell I'm not used to using it don't really know how it works and I'm going to take a piece of plastic so I, I just invent all these different ways of putting paint down so I'll squish that down in here I guess that works better with thicker paint Going to take some of this heavy body paint, which comes in a tube. This is a really great color. It's called light orange, made by Golden. Really like it. I'll just drag this across a couple of these strips. I call this stripping. I am quite the stripper. And I might hit it with the orange again here, see what that does. Here's the fun part. It's like pulling a print when you're in a printmaking situation is now I'm going to pull this up and see what I got. So it will squish that down. You can see, I hope, how the newspaper stuck in there, which is kind of nice. So I've just got some divisions, some little syncopated areas of light and bright. And my strips aren't too bad either. They could go in as collage paper, probably. Okay, now let's do a gradation of value. So I'm going to mix up some white paint and maybe I'll get some of this yellow in it. And I'm gonna add a little something dark. Here's some Payne's gray, which is kind of a bluish black, kind of a color. And just gonna build a big shape that, that covers pretty well. As you can see, I have no loyalty at all to anything that happens on here. I'll paint right over it. I'm just building layers. So the gradation is, it's going to go from darker to lighter 
to brighter. And want to make a big shape here. It's kind of a pleasant color choice, if you ask me. But um, what's fun is I may not really dig it right now, but I can change it, which is what I always knew about my life. If I don't like my life, I'm going to change it. So even just a line like that perked up that color a little bit, made me um, care for it just a little bit more. So this is intuitive painting. This is, you put something down and you react to it, or you ask what else, or what could I do to that? So while this area is pretty solidly opaque, I can scrape through it. Ninety degrees. And so this is how I approach every painting is just turning it and looking at it and evaluating it. When you paint on a board like this, it's already got a little bit of value. It's not pure white like the paper, which I don't even know now if I'll work on, we'll see. But you can see how much darker the board, the board is. So when I add white on here, it's got a pretty big impact. So maybe I wanna put white on again. And how would I do it? Well, I could wipe it on with the card again. I could um, just take this big brush and get the paint and the water out of it and put maybe a big dry brush mark on it to accentuate um, that rough sort of texture. Do I want more white? So I don't have that rule in my head anymore. If it does pop in, I try to get rid of it. That rule of, well, if you've got red here, you need red here. If you've got blue here, you need blue here. I try to balance things in a new way. So it's not so um, predictable. It's not an, what we would expect to see. Let's try the plastic again, because that paint I put on it was a little too juicy to print, but if I take some thicker paint and put it on, this is a huh, page protector, which now is a little bit dirty. See why I didn't last as a purest watercolor painter? I couldn't keep the paper white, I'm so messy. It's, it's really what I, I like about my technique is that um, usually my mistakes are what what works the best. So I put a little yellow ochre on this. Can you see it there? And what's fun about the plastic is I can kind of lay it in different places and see where I want it. And I just already know I want to maybe put it right here. So I'll just lay that down. Squish it out. Sometimes I'll actually do a painting on the plastic and print it. Or I have been known to just pick up the palette and, and uh, print that on there. That You gotta say a prayer before you do that because it's kind of scary. Joan, we have another question in the chat. Oh, I just love a question. Okay. Um, the member wants to know, do you ever work like this on paper or do you prefer boards or canvas? And the, the person follows up by saying how much they're enjoying your demo. And the person what said what? Also stated how much they're enjoying your demo. Aww, I like that person. Um, yes, I, I like to work this way on paper and I like to work this way on canvas as well. 
because I, I'm always trying to surprise myself. I don't want to get so comfortable. I always know how things are going to work. And I think um, I actually like this, you guys. Um, but And I would often put a lot more layers on it, but maybe this is a good time to set it aside. Let me just show you how some of the techniques work on the paper. But the other thing is I'll sometimes treat the surface with gels and even make a, a highly textured surface to do the techniques on so that the, the wet paint will run down in the crevices and the thick paint will sit up on top. And so finding new ways to um, do these things is what, what entertains me. So I'm always hallucinating, this is what I call it, imagining. Well, how could I do something differently? What if I just took white paint? It's going to be a little dirty because my brush has some pigment in it. And I just wipe some uh, random white on here, not because it makes any sort of a contrast, because it doesn't, but because it will affect what I put on top of it. And then if you take a water soluble something or other, I like to make these little things. Sometimes I just call them little nodules. It's kind of a gross word, but I guess that's why I like to say it because it's kind of creepy. And then turn it 90 degrees. And then what if I did something dark on here? What if I just took, um, well, what would, mm, wish there was a pretty next color that wasn't so bright. I'll just take black. I'm just gonna draw some black something on here. I've never, see, I've never done anything like this before. That's what I like, just always change it up. Maybe I'll just use this again. This is the thing still got wet paint on it. And rayer it in. Sometimes these plastic um, pieces look so great that I've glued them in. Once they get a few layers on them, they're kind of interesting. See, I couldn't invent those shapes. I like this random thing that happens. Okay, so now it's maybe, maybe I want wet into wet sort of a thing. So, and just put down some juicy paint here. Just a big lake. Oop, didn't really want to touch the wet black, but I did. Just lift it up. Just put water. It's going to melt that water soluble pencil a little bit. And then now you can see where the white paint is underneath. That's fun. I didn't know I'd get that. Joan, we have another question in the chat. The question is, um, what is the name of the board that you're using? What is it actually called? And do you have to frame your work? Okay, so um, the boards, you really don't have to. I'll just paint the edges of them dark. But a lot of them, if I'm just using the, the um, 3 8 inch deep ones, I will put them in a floater frame, which I can show you. I can grab one here in a second. Um, the paper, I glue to a canvas or to a board. And then- um, And is that- 140 or 300 pounds somebody wants. I like 140. When I started making my more money, I thought, yeah, I can get 300 pound paper. So I bought a bunch of it and I really didn't like it. And I think why I like the 140 so much more is it, it just absorbs the paint more. It goes into the fibers and stains them. Whereas what I found with the 300 pound is kind of sits up on top that, that thick surface. So I love the 140. 
So let's see, did did we get that? Um, frame it. Uh, what, what's what's the brand of the board, I guess? Was oh, the, the brand, yeah. So most of the time I use Cheap Joe's prime uh, cradled panels, but the one that, that I've got out today is ampersand, an unprimed one. But isn't it amazing, really, how much communication happens with just a few lines and shapes? I mean, you get the, the boldness of the dark, you get little areas of high chroma, bright color. Um, you've got good neutrals. You've got the movement of the value change. So it doesn't really take a whole lot to make some kind of a statement. Let's take, uh, let's see, what, what would be fun to do now? Oh, I was gonna, got uh, way late. I was gonna drop some paint into that wet lake that I put down. So I'm just glancing over to see what color I might wanna drop in. And I just let my eyes be guided as they skim the surface of the colors on the table as to what I might wanna see show up. Probably had too much water there. It won't maybe ma maintain those wonderful little blooms. I might give it a little assistance here. Turn June, it. One of our, uh, Joan, one of our members wonders um, yeah. if you use fluid acrylic because you find it more playful and, or do you use, uh, when you use thick acrylic paint, can you thin it to the um, just yes. like a fluid yeah. by adding water or how does yes. that all work? Uh-huh. So um, if I have students that come to a workshop and they just have heavy body paints, all these will work. They just have to um, dilute them with water. The um, fluids have more pigment in them. So they just go down. They're brighter. It takes less water. Plus, I travel all the time to teach, and I like these little one-ounce bottles because I can take a lot of different colors with me. These extend themselves for so long because of, of the load of pigment in them. But it is fun to uh, use all the variety of paints. So the high flows, you know, they actually put the paint down. Um, oh, even more fluid and more, more bright. I was just gonna draw with this heavy body thing on here because it's, it's so fun to get the different textures. This is actually um, thicker and sticks out. And then you've got the distance of a thin paint, which visually takes you into the painting. The dark place might come out as well. And so I'm thinking a little bit about how to layer the different um, viscosities of paint. So I'll just flick a little of this juice on. I'm gonna do the newspaper thing again, the stripping deal. And what is fun about that is not only does it squish what's underneath it, see how this, has the jig or the not jigsaw puzzle, um, crossword puzzle on it. Sometimes that will print. I'm gonna lay it down in case it does. Sometimes it'll just print right in there. So not only will this squish my thick wet paint out and change its shape, but it will lift some of the wet areas. So do I want that in there? Let's see what this will be like. We'll just brayer it in. I'll drive, drive through that a little bit. This technique's called soft brayering. And we'll flip it over this way. Uh, I think I'll take a little white paint on my fingers 
and push away from the edge. And we'll drag a little with this card somewhere. Just put it down here. We'll hit it with the colored spray. Not everywhere. <laughs> you know how it is when somebody likes doing something, then they'll just do it everywhere. And then it loses all its power. But if you have just a little bit of something, then it's got a lot of visual strength. Joe, we have an interesting question. Uh, one, one person wants to know, can you gesso over an oil painting that has been previously varnished and then use acrylic paint on it? No, we all want to. <laughs> Everybody I know wants to be able to do that. I have, I don't know if it's held up, but I have taken um, kills, you know, that paint, you're supposed to be able to paint on anything. And, and I've covered a couple oil paintings, but you're really not supposed to, to do that. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I guess I would just have to say no, or I'd be um, possibly leading you down a bad path. All right, now I'm looking at it, wanting to add another color, maybe get another gradation of value, a big shape of some kind. And I'm asking myself, how can I do it differently this time? What if I took that piece of plastic that used to be hanging around here on the left? Here it is. Oh no, it's not. Here's some notes in a thing that I've had for a while. I think I'll paint on this. I'm going to take a different color. Let's see, what would I choose if I was gonna pick another color to go into this situation? I could go red. And I'm going to paint on here. And add a little um, black. Black and red are fun. Like that color. Isn't that a good color? I think that's really great. I guess you can't see what I'm doing, can you? Here's what I'm doing, painting on the back of this plastic thing. I don't know what'll happen, but something. Oh, nice and rough and dry looking. So when you print like that, it matters what surface you're printing on. On the smooth board that hasn't got a tooth, it would have gone down smoother. But on this paper, it's got a roughness to it. I'm going to leave some of that, but I'm going to soften some of it. that I want to put a colorful edge on the thing. Didn't bring a brightly colored one over here, maybe. So let me try this one. Oh, here's orange. So um, I like to make a halation around a shape. So if you know of Wayne Tebow's work, and he did those streets in San Francisco, they're very abstract, but he's got bold color where um, shadow meets light. He will put a rim of bright color. And so it's a halation. It's, and you can actually see this in nature if you look really carefully. And it's where sunlight and shadow meet. The edge will often have this glowing 
rim. Good to get your hands in it. Always happy when I remember to put gloves on. So I've got some darks. I've got some drippy looking stuff. I've got some areas that go back. The peach color seems to be opaque and stand out. I could go in here and do some negative painting back behind. And actually that sounds kind of fun right now. And this is a mostly warm composition right now. So I'm asking myself, what if I chose a cool neutral as um, a way of making more contrast? That was green gold. I didn't want anything quite that bright. So this one is the chromium green. That's kind of a cool color, but I might not want it so green. We'll cut its intensity with a little black. And now it's too dark. So we'll scoop out a little bit of white. There, this is like a mid, Mid value, what's well, a darker mid value? Green neutral. I just want to see what this looks like on here. Still darker than I would want, maybe. So when I go in and do negative painting, I can paint around some shapes or I can call out some distraction if I've got a composition that's really busy. This one is not, not really busy. I can scrape through it a little bit. If I just wanna put a disruption in there, I can change the value as it moves along. Oh, here's a little G for good. We'll just surround it. We'll make it special. Just kind of frame it in. Go add some more white. What would happen if I smushed these two colors together? So the best thing about painting this way is just allowing yourself to play like a child. It's like, well, what if this and what if that and no rules. There is this crazy little thing that somebody gave me that melts into wet paint, but not the thick paint, I guess. Let me try it somewhere else. So this is just juicier neutral down here. It must have paint on it. It's not doing its thing. Imagine that. Your eye would get it dirty. That would be so unusual. Um, let's see, what else might I want to do to this sucker? It's kind of fun to be able to look at it in the computer. How about, um, I have this technique that I call the milky wash. Sometimes fun. So how you make it is first you get the milk, which is the white. Right now it's a heavy whipping cream. So I'm gonna dilute it till it's about the consistency of skim milk. And then I'll put it on here and encourage it to do a little dripping. So I just add a little more water to the bottom of it and see it starting to drip. I don't like to see too many drips because then it just looks like 
um, an overdone technique, but um, a few of them gives you a directional emphasis in a painting or just a different sort of an edge. Okay, so we've got some thick, some sprayed. Um, this is kind of an interesting situation that happened here. I like the drizzled paint. This peach, I could alter that color so it's not the same peach all the way through. So how would I do that? Well, I could obviously hit it with a spray, but I've already done that to the white up there. So I want to do something different. What if I took a Quinn Acridone Nickel, whatever that name is. Joan, one of our members wonders what brand of gesso you prefer. I love my golden gesso. So usually at the end of a workshop, if I've got a little bit left in a jar and I don't want to take it home, I just give it to somebody. And one of the students said, oh, this is your secret. This is the best gesso ever. And it's like, I know, it's really good. So I'm going to make this uh, quinacridone nickel azo gold into just this wash and see if I can stain part of this peach. It's still kind of wet, so I don't know how I'm going to put it on without messing up the shape. I should put it in another spray bottle. I just didn't want to, I just didn't bring one over to the table. So I've only got the one flavor. That's kind of working. This, this feathery little touch is not disturbing the layers that much. So you could, if it was dry, take this color on a paper towel and just rub it through the composition and stain this whole quadrant if you wanted. Now, if I don't like those hairy edges, you know, this is funny, finding everything. All right, so I can soften those a little bit. Joan, we have a really good question in the chat. Okay. How do you know when to stop? And what is your <laughs> thinking process when you're finishing up a painting? For example, how would you approach finishing the one you did first on the board? Okay. There just really are no answers. And how do I know when I'm done is when somebody buys it. <laughs> That's the very best. And I have, I mean, it's more my inclination to overwork than underwork. And I try to subscribe to the Picasso quote, you should stop at 90% or in my case, maybe even 70%. I have learned over time to work in shorter spurts, not try to just keep working on one painting because you will over love it and make it um, just too complicated often. Um, so there is no real good answer. I have just learned to stop sooner, which I think is a good thing for me. You can always go back later. Um, and then knowing how to finish there, you know, it's, it's just kind of a, a tough situation. It's probably the thing that people struggle with the most is, um, well, does it need anything? And what does it need? And how do I finish it? And I think part of that is because we're creating something that is so unique, so absolutely creative. It's we're creating something we've never seen before. And so how do you know if it's done? I know when I paint a landscape or a, a flower, if it looks like what it's supposed to look like, yeah. I don't know what this painting is supposed to look like. Um, so it's evolving, and I just ask myself a series of questions, which I, I always give the students to print out, which is, um, does it interest me? Does it hold my interest? 
Um, does it have too much, too many shapes, too many colors? Um, I try to keep my things in a situation where it's got a strong temperature dominance. It's either mostly warm or mostly cool. Um, is it too predictable? You know, things like that. And then if I'm unsure, I ask myself, am I unsure because I feel insecure? Like I've never seen a painting like this. And while it intrigues me, it, it doesn't resemble um, what I'm used to making. So um, if it's just that, oh yeah, that's unique. And I haven't painted like that before. I try to leave it alone and um, photograph it and um, look at it in the computer. Let's take a look at the one on the board to see. <laughs> as, you, as you change uh, paintings here, Joan, we have a couple more questions. Okay. Um, how do you decide which direction is up? <laughs> and yeah. what's your favorite brand of paper? And are most of your paintings pretty much done at the end of this process or do you go back and work on them? Oh my gosh. Okay, well that's, that's a multi-layered one. I like Arsha's 140 cold press, it's my, my very favorite paint, uh, paper. Um, what was another one of those questions? Um, how do you know which side's up? Oh yeah, well, if I've done a good job composing it, it should be able to go in every direction and it will tell a totally different story depending on which orientation you present. So I do try to wait before I sign these until somebody says, that they want to own it. And then I ask them for which direction they would like to um, have it signed and hung. So like this one, let's just say, well, I, I'm, I'm interested in this painting in all the directions. I don't have a strong preference for it. Now, if I'm making a landscape, often it has only one direction or two. Often my landscapes work um, in one, as you turn it 180, um, they, it'll still read. But um, let me just cover up that little dark spot. So this one, let's say, oh, is it done? I don't know. Um, but I'm going to sign it because somebody wants it. Stephanie said she's just got to own it. And I'm like, okay, Stephanie, I'm going to sell it to you for $900. $27.30 and you're like, okay, that's a bargain. I'm going to sign my name in pencil because she said she wants it this way. On that note, you've been painting for about 50 minutes. Okay. Really? Uh-huh. Okay. And then I'm going to spray it with Aquanet. <laughs> this is what we used to use in art school as a fixative. Oh, smells like a beauty shop around here now. So I have fixed my signature there in pencil. I like pencil because it's so easy to sign your name. And that's always what we did in printmaking. Um, and so I can get a nice signature without any effort at all. And it doesn't overtake, doesn't overpower the painting, which, you know, I didn't want my signature to be the first thing you see. And also I might print it even smaller because it could go up the side if she later decides, oh, I, she might want to hang it as a horizontal. It, it'd look okay having it go up the side. I have signed a few on the, on the edge, but um, usually I just pick a direction. Um, but I love it when it's hard to tell which direction it should go. That means that you've done a really great job of designing the space. So, um, was there another question? I can't remember. There was uh, another question and it was, let's see, do you work on paintings after you finish the process? In other words, after the one sitting. And then another question came in, do you varnish your paintings? Oh, okay. After the painting sitting, what was that? How did you say that? Do you finish it all in one go or do you come oh. back to it later? Oh, right. Yes and yes. It's, you know, sometimes the first trip through, it's like, wow, I just really like that. I don't know why, but I'm going to leave it. And other times I've worked on them for years. So I don't have a formula. This is um, vine charcoal. 
And I'm just gonna put some crumbs on it with sandpaper, just for a little spice, you know, a little seasoning, so to speak. I might also just put some scribbles out the side. And the other question, Joan, was do you varnish your paint? Varnish, yeah, yeah. So especially when I paint on a board, sometimes I will put a barrier coat on, just something to seal the surface at this level for a lot of different reasons. The barrier coat will pull the color up to the surface. The board allows the colors to seep in and they get a little bit dulled down. But when I hit it with the um, barrier coat, which I've been using polycrylic for that. And um, I'll just grab a can. It's right here on the counter. So polycrylic, you can buy at Walmart. Uh, I guess you can't read it because it's backwards, but it comes in this green can and it's polycrylic, get it plastic. All this is just plastic stuff being layered. The paint's plastic, gels are plastic. Um, and so when I put this on, it will pop my color, bring it up to the surface. And it helps me to decide if I'm finished or not. And I can paint over the top of that if I want to or not. Um, and then uh, if I decide, yeah, it's finished, I put a polymer brush on painting or uh, varnish with UV protection in it. And I buy that from Golden and it comes in matte and satin and semi-gloss and gloss. And uh, sometimes I layer lots of different varnishes on there, but um, I like to know that they're, they're well sealed. So. All right, that's been that's been just great, Joan. We have, I think, one last question, and it's someone is wondering if you have a floater frame. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on, hold your horses. Okay, so I guess this is kind of a big painting to show. You know, can you put it back to me, the, the one of just me? Yeah, thank you. So this painting is a 24 by 24 done on cradled panel. And it's in a gold floater frame. And I always paint the back side of these boards with black gesso to seal it and put the wire on it. So um, it's just a, a nice finishing touch and a little glare on it. But anyway, that's how I do them. And then if I've got a, something on paper, I will either glue the paper on all the way to the edge of the board or I'll leave a gap. So it looks like it's been matted and then put it in a floater frame. Beautiful. Uh, Joan, many people are saying thank you in the chat. Ah, uh, thanks. Thanks for thanking me. <laughs> <laughs> thanks and somebody for said here and letting me talk about what I like. And one person said she's already looking forward to your workshop. Oh, that's wonderful. We'll have a blast. Bring your friends. Right, Kathleen? Yep. Bring your friends. Exactly. <laughs> Bye. <clears throat> We do need just a few more to make sure, Joan, we get Joan out here. She's Please sign up so I can come to San Diego in January. Mm -hmm. Did that sound too desperate? <laughs> no, you're not desperate. It'll, 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 it'll get plenty, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, it'll be, it'll be really fun. I can't wait to see you. And, and I know you don't want to take the class, Kathleen, because you've been in my classes so many times, but I do hope to see you when I'm there. Oh, oh you'll see me for sure. I okay. was hitting her before we all started that yeah, oh, she I might have to take her class again. <laughs> like it was torture. No, it's really fun. <laughs> so great.
Scott, are you coming on? Scott? Is there any more questions? Hey, what? Um, oh, can you hear me now? Am I unmuted? Oh, good. Um, you know, for me, what was so fun and interesting was you don't really need to pick up much of a paintbrush. It's most anything <laughs> that's available can be used to apply and create works. So that is so true. In fact, I I think people really make awkward marks when they pick up the brush. It's better to have some kind of tool that um, allows for a random mark or a looser expression. But people, man, they choke up on that paintbrush and and you get <laughs> you know this kind of self conscious. I think that's what it is. Um, kind of a self-consciousness takes over and it becomes just a little bit more awkward. Yeah, well, uh, the, the, the free form, so to speak, is a, a great, uh, great way to approach it. I love it. <laughs> well, it's really fun. It's, it's a blast. Yeah, yeah. Well, and tell you what, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for coming and joining us today and providing us with an amazing demonstration. Uh -huh. And uh, I uh, looking forward to your class being chopped up full. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Hope so. oh. Wonderful organization. We want it. We want it to work out for you guys. Yes, we do too. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Kathleen. Anything to add to? No. Remember, um, I'm going to launch Joseph Savudic's, um ability to sign up at four o'clock today. So just there you go. Run that, so.